Good morning. It's Tuesday, the 24th of December. You're tuned in to our 10 a.m. newscast here at Arirang's New Centre in Seoul. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. In response to a police raid on one of Korea's major union umbrella groups, the nation's other major trade union group says it will join a rally supporting a mass scale strike starting Saturday. The state run railway operator announces new hires as the rail strike enters its third week. South Korea's spy agency chief says the recent execution of the North Korean leader's uncle was a likely result of conflict among state agencies surrounding Jang Song Tech's involvement in the regime's lucrative business projects. Plus, with concerns rising over a potential civil war in South Sudan, the UN Secretary General requests the additional deployment of peacekeeping personnel to the region. And let's start with the over two week long rail strike that's now starting to spill over to other areas. As the rail union and the government stick firmly to their guns, one of Korea's two major union umbrella groups has decided not to take part in the tripartite commission of labor, management and government. It says the government forced its hand when it resorted to force to round up key leaders of the other union umbrella group on Sunday. Kim Yeon Ji reports. The Federation of Korean Trade Unions, the nation's largest and oldest trade union umbrella group, held an emergency meeting of union member representatives on Monday and decided to drop out of the tripartite commission of labor, management and government. The decision severs the official channel of dialogue between the nation's labor unions and the government, as the FKTU was the sole group representing labor in the tripartite commission which was launched in 1998. The second largest trade union center that is considered to be more militant, the Korean Confederation of Trade Unions, has not taken part in the tripartite talks since 1999. Explaining its decision, the FKTU said it was appalled by the government's use of force Sunday, when police raided the main office of the Korean Confederation of Trade Unions to arrest key union leaders of the state-run rail operator, CoRail. CoRail has been striking for more than two weeks in protest of the government's decision to create a subsidiary for a new high-speed KTX train service, saying the move is the first step toward privatization. The government says the strike is illegal and it dispatched hundreds of riot police to the KCTU headquarters, taking into custody more than 130 railway union workers. The FKTU is demanding the government apologize for the raid and take disciplinary action against those responsible for the decision to use force. Until its demands are met, the largest labor union says it will refuse to talk with the government. Korea's decision to hire around 500 new workers to replace the striking railway workers has also upset the labor groups. The FKTU also says it will participate in a general strike session set for this Saturday, December 28th, in support of the rail union. Kim hyun Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye is planning on spreading a little holiday cheer over the Lunar New Year break next month by granting pardons for the first time since taking power. The presidential office said the pardons will be given to those who committed crimes because they were struggling to make ends meet, but they will exclude those guilty of corruption or those higher up on the social ladder. It added the president's decision is aimed at easing the difficulties for ordinary people. President Park did not pardon anyone on National Liberation Day in August, following through in a campaign pledge to refrain from using her right to do so. South Korea's spy agency says the North Korean leader's uncle, Jang Song Tech, was executed not because of an internal power struggle, but due to disputes over lucrative business projects. The agency also forecasts that North Korea is highly likely to carry out a provocation early next year. Han Dian reports. The fall of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's uncle, Chang Song-tek, may not have been due to a power struggle like many had speculated. 
Chief of Seoul's National Intelligence Service, Nam Jae-jun, while briefing the National Assembly's Intelligence Committee, said Chang apparently overstepped his bounds by getting involved in big business projects and that this was the main reason he was executed. The NIS chief explained Chang interfered in Pyongyang's most lucrative projects, mostly coal-related ones, sparking conflicts with the state's other financial agencies. Kim Jong-un ordered him to settle the disputes, but when Chang defied that order, he was executed for going against Kim's supreme leadership. As for Chang's wife and Kim Jong-un's aunt Kim Kyung-hee, the intelligence chief said, unlike many had thought, she has no health problems, but is rather staying out of the public eye for the moment. Nam also warned of a possible provocation by the North early next year, sometime between January and March, pointing out that North Korea's artillery units are being reinforced and more military exercises are being held. Nam said Pyongyang could forge ahead with provocations targeting the South in order to shift people's attention away from the instability domestically. Nam added the reclusive state is ready to conduct a fourth nuclear test at any time. Meanwhile, the NIS chief denied all reports that some of Chang's close aides are seeking asylum in China, saying there was no truth to any of them. Han Dan, Arirang News. Senior diplomats and defense officials of South Korea and China have exchanged views on the state of affairs surrounding the Korean Peninsula after North Korea's dramatic execution of its leader's uncle, Jang Song Tech. Seoul's foreign ministry says the two sides agreed to boost communication and cooperation, reaffirming that peace on the Korean Peninsula was their shared goal. The two nations also agreed to work towards denuclearizing North Korea. Seoul officials say they pointed out factors that intensify tensions in Northeast Asia, including China's demarcation of an air defense zone and the increasing competition between Beijing and Washington. The economic gap between the two Koreas remains extremely wide. New data from Statistics Korea shows South Korea's per capita gross national income was nearly 19 times larger than North Korea's last year. The per capita GNI for the South was estimated at roughly 24,000 US dollars while the figure for North Korea was around $1,200. South Korea's total trade volume was also over 150 times larger than the North's $6.8 billion. The only sector in which North Korea outperformed the South was in coal production. North Korea produced about 26 million tons of coal, 10 times more than the South. As part of efforts to stamp out irregular business practices in South Korea, the government plans to prohibit conglomerates from a practice called circular shareholding. A bill proposed by the National Assembly Committee on Monday would forbid major shareholders of conglomerates from controlling subsidiaries despite holding a small stake. The bill falls in line with President Park geun -hye's pledge to support the country's sustainable growth drive through fair competition, and it has bipartisan support. Some good news on the labor front now. More than 400,000 new jobs are expected to be created in Korea next year. The Korea Employment Information Service predicted an economic growth rate of 3.8% for 2014 and a total employment rate of nearly 60%. That would be a rise of 0.3 percentage points from this year, but still far below the 70 percent target for 2017, which has been set by the Park geun -hye administration. The report suggests young people will continue to struggle in 2014, since the job market is likely to favor those with more experience. While the number of employed people aged 30 and above rose this year, the number of 20-somethings in work dropped by nearly 60,000. Korea laid out an ambitious roadmap to mold itself into Northeast Asia's financial hub back in 2003. Now, 10 years later, Seoul's financial industry still lags far behind many of its Asian neighbors. So what's brought Korea to this point and where is the nation's financial industry headed? Yulian reports. While Korea is home to manufacturing giants like Samsung, Hyundai and LG, 
Korea's financial sector had lagged far behind. Despite government efforts to make Seoul a Northeast Asian financial capital on par with Hong Kong and Singapore. The Seoul International Finance Center was built with an aim to attract multinational financial companies. But after a year since its opening, Seoul's tallest and glossiest buildings now stand as a stark symbol of the country's failure to become a financial capital. The center, located in the heart of a bustling financial district in Yeoido, was a $1.4 billion project. But today, only one of the three buildings is fully occupied. The second building is at about half capacity, and the third completely empty. Simply put, Korea is not an attractive place to invest. The market is small, and the competition among domestic financial companies is already so fierce that there's not much profit to gain from Korea. Given the low prospect for growth, foreign banks in Korea have little incentive to try and expand. In the past 10 years, the number of branches and offices of foreign financial companies has shrunk from 79 to 62, a 20 percent drop. This called for a change of direction. Instead of making Seoul a financial hub, taking domestic financial firms overseas to compete in the global market. This, according to a blueprint unveiled by the Financial Services Commission last month. Experts say it's a belated but welcome move. Korean financial companies have no choice but to go abroad, given that the domestic market is saturated. It's important that these companies realize that they need to set out long-term goals. The key, he added, is to break away from their tendency to seek short-term profits and to commit to improving their overseas operations over the next 10 to 20 years. Yurian, Arirang News. UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon has asked the UN Security Council to increase the number of peacekeepers in South Sudan to better protect civilians from the worsening violence there. Reports say the 15 member council is likely to adopt a resolution approving about 5,000 more troops and police for the UN peacekeeping mission. There are currently about 7,000 peacekeeping troops in South Sudan, including Korea's Hanbit unit, consisting of some 200 and 80 engineers and medics. Violence is escalating between rebel forces led by former Vice President Riek Machar and the South Sudan government. The UN says some 45,000 civilians are currently seeking protection at UN bases in South Sudan. Two members of the Russian punk band Pussy Riot have been freed from prison. President Vladimir Putin pardoned the women as part of a wider amnesty, but they say their release is a PR stunt ahead of the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi. One of the women, Nadeza Tolikonikova, said Western countries should boycott the Games and not give in due to oil and gas deliveries from Russia. The amnesty law signed by the Russian parliament last week covers at least 20,000 prisoners, including youngsters, disabled people and pregnant women. The two band members were included as mothers. Tolo Konikova was jailed alongside her fellow bandmates in August 2012 after they were convicted of hooliganism for performing a crude punk prayer in a cathedral against President Putin's ties to the Russian Orthodox Church. Taking you now to Thailand, where anti-government protests have been swelling by the week. In battle, Prime Minister Inglak Shinawat had hoped that calling early elections for February would quell the unrest, but tensions spilled over yet again. On Monday, Connie Kim has the latest. Despite protesters' efforts to block candidates from registering for the upcoming February elections in Thailand, political parties began doing just that on Monday. Representatives for some of Thailand's political parties started arriving at Thai Japanese Stadium at 3 a.m. local time. Nine parties were able to register there, while 25 others signed up at a nearby police station. While potential candidates were gearing up for an election in February, protesters remained steadfast in their opposition. On Sunday, tens of thousands of people took to the streets of Bangkok, warning the government not to proceed with preparations. CNN reports that as many as 150,000 people showed up for Sunday's protests throughout Bangkok, 
including outside of Prime Minister Ng Lok Shinawat's house. Protest leader Su Tep Tak Suban warned the government and election commission that reforms must first take place prior to the elections. The protest leaders said they will continue to rally if Prime Minister Ng Lok remains in power. They argue that the Ng Lok government is corrupt and is controlled by Ng Lok's brother, Taksin Shinawat, the nation's former leader who was overthrown in a military coup in 2006. Connie Kim, Arirang News. A severe winter storm that's left hundreds of thousands in the United States and Canada without power could leave some in the dark for Christmas. Around 400,000 people in eastern Canada and 280,000 in the U.S. state of Michigan had no power as of Monday. Utility firms say some may not have electricity until Wednesday or even Thursday. In the U.S., heavy snowfall, storms and even tornadoes have caused flight de delays and unsafe road conditions, wreaking havoc on Americans' Christmas travel plans. At least 11 people died as the storm system moved over the area, with five people killed in accidents on ice-covered roads in Canada. More people in Korea are opting to buy diesel cars because of their greater fuel efficiency. The movement towards diesel is intensifying the competition between foreign and domestic car makers, as our Kim Min-ji reports. Kim Jong-hyun recently bought a new car. After comparing models powered by diesel fuel and those powered by gasoline, he settled on the diesel model. Although the car cost him roughly 1,900 U.S. dollars more than the one powered by gasoline would have, he concluded that the diesel car would be more economical in the long run, considering its high fuel efficiency rating. At first, I was worried about the quality of the driving experience, but now it's much better. At high speeds, it isn't much different than a gasoline car. In Korea, the diesel car market is gaining ground, and foreign automakers have also seen sales of their diesel models rise. Eight of the top ten imported cars in Korea are diesel cars, and more than 60 percent of all imported cars purchased in Korea are diesel. In the first three quarters of this year, sales of diesel cars jumped 90 percent, while sales of cars powered by gasoline and liquefied petroleum gas have been on a gradual decline. The surge is thanks to the relatively lower maintenance costs and because diesel cars can deliver up to 30 percent better fuel efficiency than similar performing gasoline-powered cars can. That's good news for local car makers like Kia Motors, which says its new K3 diesel model has been met with a largely positive response from prospective buyers. When you compare our diesel car to a comparable foreign model, there is an initial price difference of about $7,500. Despite the slightly lower fuel efficiency of the K3, it is more economical if you consider the entire cost of carry. The growth of the diesel market has ramped up the already fierce competition between domestic and imported car makers. With current market trends set to continue, Hyundai Motor and Kia Motors, the nation's two largest automakers, have said they will start producing diesel cars of all sizes, which will likely intensify the ongoing competition. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. Now, disposing of old home appliances has always been a bit of a headache, but a newly developed recycling method is catching on here in Korea, especially since you can turn trash into cash. Sun Jung in reports. Most of the discarded home appliances can be recycled, but the hard part is classifying them into the right category. But now, thanks to a new technology, recycling promises a better and more efficient outcome. This is an e-waste collector developed by local researchers that can sort out plastic into three different types and separate metals into aluminum, copper and stainless steel. The machine sorts out the waste by using near-infrared rays and analyzing the wavelength reflected on the plastic. As for the metals, it separates them by distinguishing their differences in color. Valuable waste resources that have in the past been difficult to categorize are now expected to show a recycle rate of up to 95 percent from the current 85 percent. Experts believe it will kill three birds with one stone, saving the environment, making money and creating new jobs in the industry. 
This method can also be applied to scrap cars and other waste from many different business facilities. The most promising part is to be able to contribute to the economic development in the country by securing a more superior technology than other developed countries. Experts estimate this new technology will bring about an economic effect worth some 114 million U.S. dollars annually by reducing processing times and raising a value of waste materials. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. And a good Tuesday morning to you all as we kick things off in baseball. While it's Christmas Eve here in Korea, Christmas came early for Lee Dae-ho, who signed a major deal with the SoftBank Hawks of the MPB. Now, big boy Lee Dae-ho, who had two major seasons with the Oryx Buffaloes, agreed to a 2-plus-1 contract, which will pay him up to 1.9 billion yen, or roughly 18.2 million U.S. dollars, including all the options. The SoftBank Hawks struggled offensively last season and has been aggressively going after the 31-year-old slugger as Lee Dae-ho is set to hit cleanup for the Hawks. Now, in the two seasons in Japan, Lee Dae-ho hit 48 home runs and drove in 120, uh, 82 RBIs. Now, staying in baseball, Yoon Sung Min, who has been in the U.S. all this time in hopes to sign with a major league team, came back to Korea on Sunday night. And no one knew until the following day. And as soon as everyone found out Yoon Sung Min returned to Korea, the Kia Tigers were on a mad rush to sign the pitcher once again. But the 27-year-old righty stated that he's only here to rest for the holidays and will not talk to any KBO teams regarding a contract. Instead, he added that he plans to return to the States in January, hoping to sign with a major league team before the 2014 season begins. Now, certainly a lot of baseball news this morning as the KBL announced their 2014 schedule on Monday. And believe it or not, we're about three months away from the start of the new season. With the schedules being released, the nine KBL teams will play each other 16 times throughout the season for a total of 128 games. This comes out to 576 games throughout the league in 2014, with the opening day taking place on March 29th. The schedule was made so that each team travels as little as possible in between series, with the All-Star Game taking place on July 18th. And shifting gears and finishing things off in the K-League Classic, the soon-to-be Seungnam FC, who hopes to start fresh after the city decided to take over the team, has a new head coach, and he's quite experienced, to say the least. The club decided to go with an experienced head coach and 75-year-old Park Chong-hwan, who last coached Daegu FC back in 2006. And although head coach Park hasn't coached in the past seven years, he has 41 years of experience as a coach, as his unique style of football of total offense and total defense could change the team for the better. The three-year deal will have him in the league until he's 78, in a league filled with young head coaches like Hwang son Ong and Choi young -soo. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day, and see you guys again for your sports needs. And time now to check in on the weather conditions in Korea and around the world.
And that's all from us for now, but you can always catch up with what's been happening on our website, which can be found at adidang.co.kr forward slash news. Thank you.